Artist and activist Serene Fox belongs to the first generation in her family who did not attend a residential school. That's a hard truth, but one that also points towards the significance of cultural resilience. She is the host of Future History on APTN, the Aboriginal People's Television Network, an ambassador for the Manitoba Mucklucks Storyboot School, and a leading voice among Indigenous youth in this country. And Serene Fox joins us now for more. Great to have you back here. Oh, Chimigwitch for having in me. In our studio. <laughs> well, okay, you say Chimigwitch. I want to hear some more of that. Uh, can, you, can you please introduce yourself in your native language? I would love to. And tell me what language, first of all. So it's Anishinaabe or okay. Ojibwe. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes like this. Bojo, Wabananango, Quayan, Desnikaz, Wabazation, Dodam, Anishinaabe, Quayan, Dao, Bachuana, and Donjaba, Nijo, Medalion. Um, so that's who I am, where I'm from, my clan, and the responsibility I have to my community. Bojo. Bojo. Ani. Ani. <laughs> nice to have you here. Uh, can you describe to people who are, um, who are viewing this for the first time and maybe hearing that language for the, for the first time exactly what you just said? Yep, absolutely. So I said, hello. I said, my name is Wabin Anango Kwe, which means Morning Star Woman. That's my traditional name. Uh, my clan, which is Wabazeshi or Martin, that little, little guy. Um, and I also said that I'm from Batchewana First Nation, which is near Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, and I talked about my lodge. Um, my lodge is where I practice my faith, um, and that's called the Medewin Lodge. And that's what I said. And Serene. Where does that name come from? <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually named after a, a really well-known indigenous uh, poet and artist, Serene Stump. Um, and that means like the light that guides you home. Okay. Yeah. So do, is that more a professional name, but your family calls you by your other name or how does that work? Yeah, so I got that name first on my birth certificate, but my real name is Wabunanangokwe. So um, we live in an era where having an easier name, although for me, maybe Serene was just as hard, but we grew up in an era where you had uh, two names. You had the name on your birth certificate and then your traditional name. So and people when, call me Serene. They do. And, yeah. But when did you start to introduce yourself using your more traditional name? So um, when I was two years old, I got that name and I started really using it around seven or eight. Um, and I was bullied, so I was shy about it. Um, and in the last five years, I've just been shamelessly using it all the time as part of the reclamation of who I am. Are you fluent in Anishinaabe? I'm not fluent, um, but that is my goal. So I'm actually going to be spending some of this summer in language immersion. Um, but my goal is to speak my language before I have children. Where does one learn how to speak that? Uh, it's really difficult. There are, aren't that many language speakers left, um, but the best way is an immersion. So you go um, to a community and you live in a house speaking only Anishinaabe, so no English is allowed. Um, and it's something that I had the opportunity to do while filming Future History, and I realized that that's the only way it's going to happen for me. I, I don't, I don't, I, I mean, I know that works because people uh, obviously in English speaking Canada go to parts of rural Quebec mm -hmm. and just immerse themselves completely in that, but I don't know how that. I don't know how that works. If you don't have the vocabulary <laughs> to understand what people are saying to you, how does that work? I think it's survival. <laughs> I really do think that you have to be put in a position where you're not going to get food or what you need unless you figure it out, which is why it works when people travel, oh, right? Um, it has to be necessity. So okay. uh, I want to dream in Ojibwe. And so that's the ultimate goal, is to think in Anishinaabe or Ojibwe first. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. When you dream now, you noticeably dream in English? Absolutely. Huh. Yeah, and I, I wish I, I knew what it was like to dream uh, as I am, as who I was intended to be. This is a question I'm not allowed to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How old are you? I'm 31. 31. So you're very young, um, obviously steeped in history for a 31-year-old. Why, why would it be so important to such a young person to be able to speak that language and dream in that language? Um because there are lots of my ancestors who made it to 31 without ever having the opportunity to do that. Um, so for me, I'm young, but I feel like I'm so far behind on what I could know or should know. Um, so I feel like it's an inherent responsibility to my unborn children and to my community that I pick up uh, everything that was forgotten along the way. Hmm. Mm -hmm. is, is Anishinaabeg language in danger of disappearing? Absolutely, absolutely. Because not enough people know how to speak it anymore? Yes. Because it was forbidden to be taught for many years. Absolutely. Um, so it was forcibly removed from our communities. Um, and uh, even speakers today who did grow up with the language didn't pass it on to their children because they were told um, that it would put their children in, in an unsafe position. So 
um, many speakers thought that they were protecting their children by not passing it along. You are, I guess, trying to practice some cultural resilience here. Absolutely. Uh, which clearly is important to you. How would Define that for me. What does that mean to you? Cultural resilience is about the act of reclaiming culture. It's about living in culture and breathing in culture instead of just talking about the ways that you want to search for it or find it. It's the living, breathing, practicing part of, of resilience. It's resilience really is um, vibrancy, right? And, and that good life. So we have a word for that, Minoba Madzuin. Um, and to me, cultural resilience is in that word. It means the good life. And again, I want to, um... We're going to tread on some tricky, politically incorrect ground here, but what yeah. the hell? Let's just yeah, do let's this. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> do you consider yourself a Canadian as well? I do not. Yep. Um, I do not consider myself a Canadian um, by definition, although I consider myself the truest Canadian in another sense. Explain. Uh, I've always been from here. So of course I'm uh, patriotic to this country. Um, I believe in this country. I believe in the land we stand on. It's all I've ever known. My people have always been from here. Um, but because I pre-exist Canada, I feel that I am much older than Canadian, that I am part of um, the original uh, true intention of this land. So uh, it's the opposite of what people think. I don't say I'm not Canadian because I'm not patriotic to this land. I just feel that I predate that word. Um, and by saying that, I identify with so much more of the rich and vast history that existed here, um, what I like to call um, the first chapter. So before the first chapter. Yeah. Having said that, you, you have to deal with the political realities of living with the crown, uh, et cetera, in, yeah. in present day <laughs> nation state Canada. Uh, this current government of Canada, can I ask you a political question? Yeah. Current, the current government of Canada made a number of promises to Indigenous people three and a half years ago when they first got elected. How well do you think they've done? Not well enough. Um, you know, I think that the Trudeau government really relied on the Indigenous vote, and in fact, the Indigenous vote, I believe, helped um, get him into power. Um, during the election, we saw ballots. Um, the first time ever, Indigenous communities actually ran out of balance. That's how high the Indigenous vote representation was. Um, but you know, two years ago, I sat in the back of a pickup truck with Justin Trudeau at Show Lake 40, and I asked him face to face, um, do you intend to keep the promises that you made to Indigenous people? And um, face to face, he promised me that he would keep those promises. And I find a personal promise to be way more meaningful um, than one just made in a campaign. And um, I'm sad to say that I don't believe that he is um, going to be able to keep those promises. I don't know if he intended to not keep them, but I don't think he'll be able to. Which do you think is the most significant one not yet kept? Water access to clean water for all indigenous people across the country. Um, he vowed to end all boil water advisories. Um, Georgina Island, which is an hour away from here, it's literally an hour from where we're sitting in this studio, is still on a boil water advisory. So to me, if we don't even have access to clean water an hour outside of Toronto, um, there needs to be much more done. They have said March 2021 is their <laughs> deadline, right? They expect by March 2021, now admittedly that's after this mandate ends, they expect yeah. it to be completed. Yeah. You, you laughed when I said that. <laughs> because it was supposed to be in four years at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I'm laughing because uh, well, this is the way that policy works. It is so hard um, to implement change. And so I understand that from a political perspective, that it takes a lot of time to make change. Um, but quite frankly, when we're talking about access to clean water and basic human rights, um, it should be an immediate response. And it should be treated the same way that Walkerton was treated, which was an immediate response. I guess for, for those who don't remember Walkerton, I guess it's about, I don't know, is it 20 years ago now? Yeah, I was Something. a youngster. I think I was 10 or 11, so yeah. that makes sense. Right. Um, Mike Harris government in power, mm -hmm. an enormous crisis with the water system there. Mm -hmm. um, people died, thousands got sick. Anyway, that's, that's Walkerton for those who don't remember. Mm -hmm. And yes, there was, a, there was a commission of inquiry. There was an enormous amount of effort uh, undertaken to make sure the water got cleaned up after that. Mm -hmm. Here's what we, uh, you know, we reached out to the federal government. We asked them to... to send us a statement, and here's what they said. Since forming government, we have worked closely with our Indigenous partners to renew Canada's relationship with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We have invested $21.3 billion in new funds over four budgets to support this work. We know that there is so much more to do, and we will continue to work closely with Indigenous peoples. 
Reconciliation is an ongoing shared journey and we are firmly committed to this work. I should give you a chance to respond to that. That's from the, 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 two, the offices of the two ministers who are responsible for the indigenous files, Carolyn Bennett, Seamus O'Regan. What do you say? I say um, thank you for the work that has been done. Um, as indigenous people of this land, we need to be made a priority. Um, and I think that when you make promises, you have to be very careful. Because um, unfortunately, this government uh, has no room to break any more promises with indigenous people. Um, so I think that statement talks about what has been done. It still does not address the current question that I and many other indigenous people have, which is, where are the answers and where are the um, policies that will keep the promises that were made? Uh, you know, Brian Mulroney used to have an expression, which was, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. Are you convinced? <laughs> you haven't heard that one before, have you? No. He had a lot of good lines. Uh, okay, but it's a fair enough point. I mean, you're, I, I understand your disappointment with the Trudeau government. Do you have any reason to suspect any different party in power would be any better? No, I, I think that... Um, Interacting with Indigenous peoples and treating us as sovereign entities has always been very challenging um, for any government in power. I think, yes, has the Liberal, go liberal government been more willing, more vocal, um, and perhaps more capable? Um, that is a conversation that is being had right now. But I think as an Indigenous person, I can't play party policies. All I can look at is the current framework and where we're at and what we need to do to push forward, no matter what government uh, is um, in power. I think that it's going to be the same work for Indigenous people, harder or easier. Um, the Canadian government just doesn't seem to want to align with true Indigenous sovereignty, rights to title, and Indigenous rights. So um, who's going to do it? I, I can't wait to see. As you can tell, I have not wanted to derail this interview by talking about the one word that has completely um, overwhelmed mm -hmm. uh, the, the conversation between Canada and Indigenous people over the last couple of weeks, and that is the use of the word genocide mm -hmm. in the Royal Commission on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, the report of which came out uh, earlier this month. Um, well, let me read this. Let me read this and I'll get you to react to that in this way. Here's yeah. Erna Paris, author of Long Shadows, Truth, Lies and History, writing in the Globe and Mail. The inquiry's conclusion that Canada is a genocidal state lines up with the distortion of language characterizing much of contemporary political discourse. It may also be an assertion of power a la Carroll in the Era of Donald Trump, in which insult is normalized, where journalists are characterized as enemies of the people, and where Canada's negotiable trade demands are improbably described as a national security issue, shock and awe language may be seen as a way of propelling one's words above the din. Okay, you know there's been an enormous amount of blowback from, from, the, you know, from Canadians who think that that's an overreach. Mm -hmm. What's your position? I'm a survivor of genocide. The policies that were enacted against my people were made to eliminate my existence. Um, and I think that we can talk about the word and we can talk about what it means. And I think in that article, which I did read, um, the real truth of that is not wanting to take our history into um, the conversation of what's going on right now with our women. Uh, and if you talk to any Indigenous scholars or any, um, you know, anyone who's really well-versed in Indigenous history, you know that you cannot separate where we have been from where we are now. And in fact, it takes three generations for true assimilation to even take place. So we're actually pretty close to it still. Um, I'm the first generation in my family not to go to residential school. Um, I have aunties who can still tell me the story of when their heads were shaved and um, when their hair was taken from them and their languages were taken from them um, and then when they were forcibly removed from their communities. Um, my aunt has stories of the last time she saw her brothers as she was removed and taken to residential school. Um, the, the experience of suicide in my own life, um, my father suicided, my aunt suicided, and I have many cousins who are not with us anymore. Um, I hate that I have to bring those things up to prove that what has happened to me, my family, and our communities absolutely was nothing short of an attempted genocide, and for many of us, absolutely just straight up genocide. Do you make a distinction between a cultural genocide, which even the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada said mm -hmm. happened, uh, with, with a genocide that I suspect is more clearly identified in people's minds, which is 
Jews in gas chambers being burned in ovens, Rwandans having their limbs hacked off. Mm -hmm. I suspect that's what most people think when they think genocide. Both of which were implemented based on the learnings of what happened in Canada. So the Rwandan genocide was modeled after what happened to indigenous people in Canada. So um, both of those things you just brought up are conversations I have quite often. My mom is a professor um, and she wrote a book with a colleague called Case Critical um, with Ben Carroll and he is a Holocaust survivor. And so they're constantly comparing um, the ideologies of what it means to have survived that and what it means for the indigenous experience. And I think for many um, Jewish Canadians, they have no problem seeing the similarities. So and we shouldn't compare tragedies. I mean, absolutely. Tra that's, this that's is outrageous to begin with. But, yeah, I think that yeah. the the comparison of, of poverty porn and all of mm -hmm. these things um, of injustice is, is the wrong way to go. Yeah. But you can use it to say that all of these things were inspired by what happened here on this land. And um, if you look at massacres where thousands of indigenous people were murdered um, and buried in mass graves, if you look at the Pine Ridge um, standoff at Wounded Knee, um, or the longest walk that happened to the Navajos, or the Trail of Tears that happened to the Cherokee, where thousands of indigenous lives were lost um, based on the forced removal to make way for progress and resource extraction, I'm sorry. We should be upset about what has happened and what has conspired. Be, be so passionate. If you are against the word genocide, then why? Why is that a trigger for you? I hope it's because you are so appalled by the truth and history of this country that you cannot even imagine to live in a place where that is the truth. I hope that's the reason that people are appalled. Um, because if you look at my history from where I stand inside the indigenous worldview, um, it is way more upsetting to be denied the truth than to know um, are your history. So that's just how I feel about it. That's, incredible. that's incredibly powerful. I'm gonna just let that sink in for a second. I'm gonna take a moment. Uh, and I wanna change gears on you here. You mentioned somebody in the midst of that answer. Mm -hmm. uh, your mom. My mom. Get a shot of your mom here. Can we put this up? Hey, <laughs> my mom. <laughs> Is That's, she the one who inspired you to become an activist? Absolutely. That's Anje Benisi Kwe. Um, her Translate, name, please. Yeah, her name <laughs> is Changing Eagle Woman. Yeah. And uh, she's a, a healer and a professor um, and an activist. And she raised me in my culture uh, to never question who I was um, and to understand that I come from thousands of ancestors who fought for me to be here today. Um, and I have a responsibility to them to continue their work. My hunch is she's probably pretty damn proud of you. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is National Indigenous Peoples Day today. Yeah. So let's finish on this. What do you hope people who are not indigenous in this country will take away from the work that you're doing? Yeah, um, my hope is that people will take a look at all the young indigenous people who are doing incredible work. Um, you know, I have to shout out some of the incredible work that I've been able to be a part of, um, partnerships um, with organizations like Tread Right, um, Manitoba Mukluk, Story Boot School. Um, I just was in Australia bringing that work to them. So um, I think it's so important for people to focus on all of the resiliency that is happening in the community. Find the partnerships, find the work that is going on. Um, go find indigenous music, dance, theater, clothing. Um, there are ways in which you can support the indigenous worldview and ideology in Canada um, in ways that are fun and are way in ways that will promote um, your knowledge and your truth seeking. So I think for all of Canadians, they uh, are interested in reconciliation. And I think that's not enough. You've got to seek out reconciliation and the truth of your community, the history of your community and the land you stand on. So um, I want to say happy Indigenous Peoples Day, but every day should be Indigenous Peoples Day in Canada. And we should all work to celebrate and uplift each other, um, but also letting Indigenous voices leave. Uh, lead, sorry, um, nothing about us without us. Reconciliation, that's the first time I've heard that. It's the only way to say it, you reconciliation. Just make, just make that up? No. Is that your word? You've no. heard that before, right? Yeah, hmm. and uh, you know, I was in the room when um, the TRC handed down their final recommendations, Murray Sinclair, I call my uncle, and um, 
he's a perfect example of the incredible work um, that is being done, and, and people need to pay attention to that work. Um, for too long, we've been just wanting to focus on the worst parts of Indigenous um, communities in Canada, and oh my goodness, there's so much to lift up and to be proud of. So let's find it, let's celebrate it, and um, let's change our collective narrative. Amen. That's Serene Fox, activist, artist, and someone who makes her mama proud every day. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming into TVO tonight. Jimmy Gwitch, thank you. Jimmy Gwitch to you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.